morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Helen Christians, and I will be your MC this morning. I'm here at Friendly House with our Friendly House folks. So glad you're here with us this morning. Thank you for coming in. And we also have got a great Zoom audience. Uh, thank you, Zoom folks, for being here. Our speakers also Zoom. So uh, uh, we will, she'll be coming in in just a few minutes. But uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Very, very appreciated. Humanism is a philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion. Humanists like us, who are gathered here today, attempt to live the best life that we can envision because this is the only life of which we are certain. Humanism affirms the dignity of all people and the need to treat our fellow humans as our equals. Humanists value their fellow humans not only for all that they have accomplished in art, science, and humanity, but also simply for their human potential. And this morning's uh, program, Kim Wan Chung State Historic Site, which is a, we're going to get a tour of a, of a museum that's in far eastern Oregon in John Day. But it especially addresses the humanist commitment of global of global awareness, even though it's right here in Oregon. So we'll we'll find out about that. That's uh, I find this very interesting how Oregon was such a a, a place where uh, humans from all over the world gathered uh, as we began our uh, and have been you know for for decades, centuries, and probably millennium. Uh, Ann Henderson's our our reader this morning, a very popular reader. Ann, are you there? Right. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a, a reading, but it's Robert oh, Ingersoll oh. and his, uh, um, um, I think his, his uh, what he, well, one of his first readings, one of his first uh, writings. When oh. I became convinced that the universe is natural, that all the ghosts and gods are myths, they're entered into my brain, into my soul, into every drop of my blood, the sense, the feeling, the joy of freedom. The walls of my prism crumbled and fell. The dungeon was flooded with light and all the bolts, all the bars and the manacles became dust. I was no longer a servant, a serf or a slave. There was for me no master in all the wide world, not even in infinite, in infinite space. I was free, free to think, to express my thoughts, free to live to my own ideal, free to live for myself and those I loved, free to use all my faculties, all my senses, free to spread imagination's wings, free to investigate, to guess and to dream and to hope, free to judge and determine for myself, free to reject all ignorant and cruel creeds, all the inspired books that savages have produced and all the barbarous legends of the past. Free from popes and priests, free from the, all the called and set apart, free from sanctified mistakes and holy lies, free from the fear of eternal pain, free from the winged monsters of the night, free from ghosts, devils, and gods. For the first time, I was free. There were no prohibited spaces in all the realms of my thought. No air, no space where fancy could not spread her painted wings. No chains for my limbs. No lashes for my back. No fires for my flesh. No master's frown or threat. No following another's steps. No need to bow or cringe or crawl or utter lying words. I was free. I stood erect and fearlessly, joyously faced all the worlds. And then my heart was filled with gratitude, with thankfulness, and went, and went out in love to all the heroes, the thinkers who gave their lives for the liberty of hand and brain, for the freedom of labor and thought, to those who fell in the fierce fields of war, to those who died in dungeons bound with chains, to those who proudly mounted scaffold stairs, to those whose bones were crushed, whose flesh was scarred and torn, to those by fire consumed, to all the wise, the good, the braves of every land, whose thoughts and deeds have given freedom to the sons of men. And then I vowed to grasp the torch that they had held 
and hold it high that light might conquer darkness still. Oh, Anne, thank you. Beautiful. You're welcome. That was beautiful. You're welcome. Michaela Coleman is a regional park ranger at Cam Wa Chung uh, State Heritage Site, which is also referred to as, uh, can be, might be more commonly referred to as the Chinese Pharmacy. Ranger Coleman is a longtime Eastern Oregon resident. She is passionate about the history of Grant County and actively works to have the history of Grant County accurately presented. In May, I visited uh, the Kim Wan Chung Historic Site and was fascinated uh, by Ranger Coleman's presentation. And uh, she was, I'm so pleased that she's here with us this morning to share this. this um, it's an amazing story. It is amazing story in so many ways. So I'm so glad you're all here and that she's willing to present to us today. Welcome Ranger Coleman, come on in and uh, give us a tour. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and be able to share it all with you today. There we go, so welcome. Um, we are now looking at what is the Cam Watchung building. Um, this area of John Day was once the third largest Chinese community in Oregon. So the borders of that community are the green fence that we can just pick out down here to the south. There is a creek just behind this building at the edge of the lawn to the west. The back of these homes to the north and the road behind this hedge to the east. Within this space, the area would swell to over 2,000 Chinese residents, especially on holidays and weekends. Um, that's a pretty substantial number. Today, John Day is just under 1,700 and Grant County is right around 7,000. Um, so again, really substantial numbers for this area. The majority of folks that were here uh, during this time period were here for gold. That was first discovered just south of John Day by about two miles in Canyon City in 1862. Um, our gold rush lasted for about 50 years until around 1910. And in that time period, over $26 million in gold was harvested from this county. That's when gold was only about $30 an ounce and today it's well over a thousand. So we could imagine that that 26 million would be billions today. At the time that gold was discovered and shortly thereafter, John Day was not a city or even a community. Canyon City was the main hub of commerce. That was once the largest town in Oregon and actually lost the vote to state capital by one during that time period. <laughs> Very different than what we see today. Today, Canyon City is only about 400 residents, and that's due to a number of reasons. Three of those being that Canyon City had burned down three times between 1862 and 1937. One of those fires was the 1885 fire of the Chinese community in Canyon City. Following that fire, the majority of those Chinese residents were not allowed to rebuild within Canyon City. So they joined this community here in John Day. The building that we're looking at now was first constructed in 1865 as a stagecoach stop or supply depot on the Dallas Canyon City Wagon Trail, a main line of commerce for this area. The original portion of the building from 1865 is just this largest stone that we see beneath the highest peak. We can see that it was made with conflict in mind. We have iron shutters over the windows, metal covering this door behind the screen door, and of course that heavy stone construction. So built to keep the supplies and the people inside safe during times of conflict, whether that was stagecoach robbers or something else. This upper story was added around 1895 by two gentlemen that I'll talk a lot about today, Ing He and Long An. They added this upper story with the hope that they would need additional space for borders with the idea that the railway was coming to John Day, but it never did. The closest it ever made it was Prairie City, Oregon, which sits about 13 miles east of John Day today, or Seneca, Oregon, which sits about 26 miles south, but never John Day. So this upper story was actually a pre-existing building here in this community, which they purchased and moved on top of the building. Mm -hmm. um, if we go around the backside of the building here, you can actually see that there is a second door on the backside that was once someone's back door at ground level at one point. <laughs> Never had an external uh, staircase. Let's see here, let me get us turned back around for a moment. This portion over here, furthest to the north below that lowest peak was added around 1914. And I'll tell you more about that area when we're inside. 
So as I've already mentioned, their names, Ing He and Lung An, they were born in 1953 in a southern province of China known as Toisan. So they were born right around the same time that gold was first discovered here in Grant County. They did not know each other in China at all, but by the time they were each about 18 years old in the early 1880s, they decided to immigrate to the United States. When they did so, they each left behind a wife and children, which they would never see again. Lung An immigrated through San Francisco, where he quickly learned to read, write, and speak English fluently. He was known to be able to seamlessly transition between the two. Ing He immigrated through northern Washington and settled in Walla Walla, Washington for a number of years. He immigrated alongside his father and five of his uncles. They all came from a long line of traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, so they were all doctors. Around 1885, Ing He's father decided to return to China, and Ing He decided to set out on his own for this bustling community that he'd been hearing so much about, John Day. He arrived here right around the peak population of this area. At that same time, Lung An also left San Francisco headed for John Day, and this is where they met in 1885. At the time of their arrival, this structure was already leased by Chinese immigrants starting in 1871. That first set of immigrants opened a mercantile and gave it its name that it's carried throughout history, Kamwa Chung and Co. This has a couple of different meanings. The historic translation of Kamwa Chung is golden flower of prosperity, but the modern simplified translation of that is golden Chinese outpost. As we know, the Chinese language was simplified during the last century. There was a wide amount of variance between different dialects and language used by the classes. Because of that, all of the documents that you'll see inside this building today are written in a historic dialect. That means anytime we'd like to have them translated, they have to go out to an entire board and that board has to collectively agree based off of context and dialect clues. As you can imagine, a painstakingly long process. We actually have the largest collection of Chinese immigrant documents from the Gold Rush West in North America at over 20,000 documents. The majority of those are not fully translated a testament to how difficult it can be to gather a board of scholars in John Day and then have that board collectively agree on those context and dialect clues. At the peak of the building, which we can see here, is the original sign from 1871, reading in English, Kamwa Chung and Co. These are also the original exterior colors, which we've matched through core sampling. So this is the most accurate depiction of this building in its heyday. Pretty vibrant for a time period when our reference is typically black and white photos. After arriving here in 1885 and becoming fast friends, by 1888, Ing He and Lung An were ready to go into business together. So they approached the owner of this building and asked to purchase it. This was pretty unusual. In 1882, a series of laws went in place throughout the United States known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. This was a very severe set of laws. This typically prevented Chinese residents from owning property, having bank accounts, voting, testifying in court, and severely limited the immigration of women and children. Depending on region, this could also include even more severe laws. Throughout Oregon, sundown law was in place, and here in Grant County for a portion of that time, Chinese residents were not allowed to own firearms or weapons of any kind. The Chinese Exclusion Act was in place until 1943 and was rescinded as a condition of China joining the allyship. So a very long period of time for that severe set of laws to be in place. That's a big part of what made it so unusual that in 1888, when Ing He and Lung An approached the owner of this building and asked to purchase it, they were successful. In fact, they signed a 99-year lease with an addition to purchasing this building to guarantee that this structure could not be taken from their ownership during their lifetime. Thankfully, they were successful in securing that building. They continued under, or excuse me, <laughs> getting a little tongue-tied here. They continued the existing mercantile in place since 1871. They continued under the same name of Kamwa Chung & Co, and they added a doctor's office. They continued to live and operate in this building until 1940 when Lung An passed. At that time, Ing He was legally blind, so they really needed some assistance in operating these businesses. 
They called on one of Inghe's family friends known as Bob Waugh. They referred to Bob as Inghe's nephew. He was living in the Boise area of Idaho, and he was quick to agree to join Inghe here in John Day and in business in this building. So he moved over. Along with Bob came his wife, Rose, and their three children. So a family of five moved into this building with Inghe. Once you see the inside, uh, you'll realize why you might not want to raise a family of five in this building in the 1940s. So they actually built this home that sits just behind us to our left here in the early 1940s. It's had quite a few additions onto it since then, but the area that we can see here closest to us is the original Waugh family home. In 1948, Inghe fell in the Kamwa Chung building and broke his hip. That day, he locked the doors, assuming that he'd be back within a few weeks to continue business, and he went to Portland to receive care. He remained in Portland in a care facility for four years until he passed in 1952. Today, both Inghe and Lung An are buried on this hill just north of the building here, overlooking the John Day Valley and Kamwa Chung. They are the first people of color to be buried in that cemetery. When Inghe passed in 1952, he left this building to his nephew, Bob Waugh. By 1955, Bob and Rose were ready to move on and try something new. So they approached the city of John Day and offered them this building for an extremely low price, but on the condition that it be maintained as a museum. The city quickly agreed and just as quickly forgot. They built the city pool that was once here, um, no longer stands today, but they built this city pool in 1958, just north of the building. They created the surrounding city park. And by 1968, they were ready to demolish this building in order to expand that city park. One of our city council members at the time decided that he wanted to see what was inside before it was gone. His name was Gordon Glass. He went in with just a flashlight and saw what you will see today. Everything in this building, unless otherwise specified, is from 1948 or before. Some of those items are truly incredible. Since that day when Gordon Glass rediscovered what was here in this building, he became a huge advocate for the continued preservation of this building. Assisting in rediscovering that agreement between Bob Waugh and the city of John Day and ensuring it was upheld. And thankfully, he was successful. In 2006, it outgrew in popularity what the city was able to accommodate, and it became an Oregon State Park. It's also been a National Historic Landmark since 2005 and a registered historic place since the early 1970s. So we've now just come through what was the main entrance of this building for the entirety of its use. I'm gonna turn us around to get a closer look at that doorway. We take a look at the inside of this door. We can actually see a wow. single bullet hole right here. Um, the exterior of this door is covered in metal, but that metal is not thick enough to stop, its, uh, stop a bullet and that was not its intended purpose. The metal that covers the exterior of this door is specifically intended to help prevent fire if someone were trying to light the interior of this structure on fire through the wood door. But as we can see today, that bullet did pass all the way through. Let me get it situated into a good spot here real quick. Okay, so we are now in the main room of this building. The room that we're looking at now had a lot of different purposes. This was a waiting room, a doctor's office, a mercantile, a business office, a social hub, a cultural hub, a spiritual center, a gambling house, and on occasion, many other things. So this was a very busy room that we're looking at today. If you came here to see Ing Hei, later known in our community as Doc Hei, he would ask that you wait on a stool like this. There are four of these in this room today and they block two of our doorways, but those would have been spread throughout the room and both this doorway in front of us now and the one slightly to our left would have been kept shut. When it was your turn to see Doc Hay, he would ask that you sit in this red chair. You would sit down with both of your palms facing up and your arms extended. He would place a small white silk pillow under either of your wrists and at this point he would read over 27 different pulses in your body. This was his specialty. He was a pulsologist. He was an incredibly gifted healer, able to effectively treat things that would have otherwise been a death sentence in the Gold Rush West. We should consider that Western medicine was really in its infancy at this time. So someone being able to effectively treat things like tetanus or sepsis was nearly a miracle. 
And Doc Hay was doing just that. He was performing those miracles for this community. Let me move us into our apothecary here. Want to get us turned around in the right direction. <laughs> Sorry if I make anyone seasick. It's a tough thing to move around this 3D model. <laughs> so after Doc Hay determined what was happening with you, he would come in here to his apothecary. In here, there are over 560 ingredients from all over the world. Of course, across Asia and Europe, but also Africa, Australia, South America, and some local ingredients. The use of local ingredients is especially interesting as this would have been the first time that Doc Hay was in contact with them. So he was determining what to use, how to use it, and how to derive what he needed from it. You can see one of those local ingredients in this jar right here. In the bottom of that jar is a dried rattlesnake. <laughs> we also have some other ingredients in here that would be considered a little odd by Western standards. To the far left of that snake, you'll see the belly of a turtle shell. Back here on our counter, you can also see, excuse me for just a moment to get us situated, a bear paw, an antler, hooves, and a dried gecko. All items that are still used in Eastern medicine today, and now a lot of those are scientifically backed as effective forms of treatment in the correct combination. After Doc Hay gathered the ingredients for your formula, he would mix them in a mortar and pestle or this coffee mill that is over here on the far left hand side. The majority of Doc Hay's formulas ended as teas. Sometimes these would need to steep for up to 12 hours. It said that they smelled horrible and tasted even worse, but they were extremely effective and that's what mattered. Excuse me. Doc Hay also offered a service in partnership with Lung On where you could write in with a list of your ailments. Lung On or, would read or translate those for Doc Hay and they would return to you a formula through the mail. If you received your formula through the mail or took it to go, it would come in one of these brown paper bags on the right hand side of the counter along with one of these white index cards. Those white index cards are brewing directions. The unit of measurement for water on those brewing directions is measured in beer bottles. It would have been a luxury to have a measuring cup in the Gold Rush West, but you definitely had a beer bottle. <laughs> All of these small bottles that we see at the front are certain kinds of medicine. Some of these slightly larger bottles that we see are ointments, or excuse me, powders that would become ointments for bug bites and things like that. But these especially small jars are what is referred to as pochai pills. Eastern medicine having been practiced for thousands of years, it makes sense that they would take note of common ailments and create mass produced medication to treat those. Pochai pills is a wide term that covers a variety of different formulas. They have formulas for things like heartburn, headaches, upset stomachs, backaches, food poisoning, allergies, the common cold, a hangover, anything that you'd walk into Walgreens for today, there is a pochai pill formula for. The majority of pochai pills look like you can possibly see in this bottle here, very small red pills, and you actually take up to one bottle as one serving, depending on the severity of your ailment. These are still widely used today. In fact, one of the companies that Doc Hay was importing from was located in Hong Kong. That same company is still in Hong Kong today, owned by the same family and using the same formula. Pretty incredible. So this is the only room that we'll see today completely covered in wallpaper. The wallpaper we can see from this perspective is a historic reproduction. But I'm going to turn us around here for just a moment to show you the original. <laughs> they ordered this wallpaper straight out of a Sears and Roebuck catalog for Doc Hay's bedroom. We're now looking at what was his bedroom from 1888 until he fell and broke his hip in 1948. So 60 years in the same room. On his nightstand, you'll see this flower pot with a lot of short red sticks. That is the first and most simplistic of the altars that we'll see today. Those short red sticks are the bottom of burned incense. Also on the nightstand, you can see a cleaver. As I mentioned during a portion of the Chinese Exclusion Act here in Grant County, Chinese residents were not permitted to own weapons of any kind, including firearms. So a kitchen utensil was truly your next best line of self-defense. They actually kept one in every room of this building to be used as such. Just under the bed here, we can see the edge of this white enameled bucket with a lid. This is the closest this, or excuse me, closest this building has ever been to an indoor restroom. Starts to make sense why you're not raising your family of five in here in the 40s. 
just to the right of that white enameled bucket, you can see the edge of this black trunk. This trunk is famous throughout our community. When they reopened this building in 1968, they opened that trunk. Inside was over $23,000 in uncashed checks. These ranged from a little before 1910 until a little after 1930. It was well known in the community at the time that Doc Hay was not cashing all of the checks he received, and one of his friends asked him why. He said, they're good people and they need it more than I do. He really came to care for this community in more than just a medical sense. We know that he was cashing checks during that time period. He was just doing so at his own discretion for families that he felt could afford it. We do keep copies of those checks on display today in our interpretive center. They are organized alphabetically by last name and they would be valued at just under a half million dollars today. Pretty incredible. Give you a look around the other side of the room here. Do we have any questions so far about Doc Hayes' bedroom? Yeah. Thank you, Rob. It looked like there was a window that was uh, blacked out. What in the in in the room that you've been showing us? Yes. Uh, what what what's going on there? So yes, there is a window here. Um, all of the windows on this building are shuttered. Um, over half of them have iron shutters, um, and we do keep those closed still today to help prevent light damage um, for security purposes and things like that. Um, but as you may have noticed on the original portion of wallpaper on the left wall here, um, there was quite a bit of uh, grime on that. Um, both Doc Hay and Lung On were known to smoke cigars. Um, they also used kerosene and alcohol lamps throughout their time in this building um, until a little after the turn of the century. So part of the black that you're seeing on this window is just soot and grime. <laughs> There's quite a bit of it in the building. So I'm going to bring us back out here to the main room and get us adjusted. Okay, so in this corner right here is the second altar that I'll show you today. As I mentioned, everything in this building, unless otherwise specified, is from 1948 or prior. That includes these oranges. They are from 1948 at the youngest. We have an incredibly dry climate here, so they've been allowed to just perfectly dry out here in this building. I have a lemon doing the same thing at my house right now. <laughs> so here in the center of the mercantile, this is the largest altar that you'll see today. These are very specific to the Chinese residents of the United States during the gold rush. While you can find altars for the same purpose in China during that time period, they are not the largest or most grand within the space as we see for the residents of the US at that time. This is one of six that currently remains in documentation and is one of the most grand and well-preserved of those six. These are called a Sui Jin Bo altar. They are specifically for the purpose of warding off plug and illness and promoting health and wellness. A true indicator that the Chinese residents of the U.S. at that time were more concerned with simply surviving than making a fortune or anything else. Let me see if I can get us a little bit closer here. That might have been a little too close. Let's see. We'll try from this angle here. Just here in the center of that altar, you can just see the edge of two grapefruit, again from 1948 at the youngest, and these hangings are also a part of that. All of the flowers at the top are handmade from paper. There's a lot of intricate beads, silk, and gold leaf work throughout. We have the receipt for one of these. It was imported in 1916 from China. As we look around the mercantile today, we see a lot of Western brands, but this was not the case when it was first opened with that first set of immigrants in 1871 or when Long An took over in 1888. But that started to change towards the turn of the century. By 1910, there were only 50 Chinese residents remaining in J John Day on census record. So from a number that could swell to 2000 and over on holidays and weekends to 50 pretty quickly. At that same time, Doc Hay's reputation as an incredible healer was taking a stronghold throughout the West. Because of the shift of traffic to this building during that time period, they shifted the items that they carried. By 1910, the majority of Doc Hay's patients were white, so a lot of Western items. Because of that, we will recognize a lot of these items today. We have Quaker oats on the top shelf, 
looks just about the same today, but with a plastic lid. There's also Post Bran Flakes, Early Raisin Bran, MJB Coffee, Shilling Coffee here in the corner. We also have a bottle of Lee and Parents. The short blue can right here is canned marshmallows. <laughs> just below that on the shelf is some jars of Vaseline. You can also see latex bandages, a tube of Alka-Seltzer. These blue tins are aspirin, and some of us will recognize this jar right here. That is Pond's. Um, at the time, it was known as Pond's Vanishing Cream, but today we know that as Pond's Cold Cream. It looks, looks almost exactly the same in the stores today, that same shape of a white jar with the blue lid. Just below that on the shelf, this box here is candy-coated marshmallow Easter eggs. You can also see Christmas candles alongside the clips to hold those Christmas candles onto your Christmas tree branches. Early Christmas lights. I'm gonna get us a little bit turned around here. So this end of the mercantile is what I like to refer to as the bachelor section. This is mostly intoxicants. So we have more caffeine through tea and coffee as well as liquor and tobacco products, including Havana cigars. Again, we'll recognize quite a few of these today. We have Four Roses Bourbon, Gordon Dry Gin. Here on the top shelf, we have a carton of Camels, Beech Nut Chewing Tobacco. Over here on this side, you'll also see another pack of Camels, Prince Albert in a can, and Zigzag Rolling Papers, all brands that we can still recognize and reference today. So let me, I'd like to point out this cut in the floor right here. It'll be a little bit difficult to see when we're a little bit closer. But you can see how those series of cuts line up on those floorboards. So that cut attaches to the rest of these here as well. That is a trap door. When they reopened this building in 1968, they also noticed that trap door. Under the floor of this building, as well as in the walls and ceiling, was 98 bottles of this bourbon Kentucky whiskey. This is pre-prohibition era whiskey manufactured between 1913 and 1917. When this became in Oregon State Park in 2006, there was only 33 bottles left in the collection. <laughs> <laughs> the city had a great time. Um, they drank a lot of it. They gave boys door prizes. They raffled it off. Whatever they felt like was what they considered to be in excess. We had these bottles assessed around 2015, and at that time, they assessed it over $10,000 each. That means the city disposed of over a half million dollars in bourbon. <laughs> why the bachelor section? <laughs> um, I refer to it as the bachelor section as this community for a long period of time um, was mostly bachelors. Um, being a wild west kind of area, you know, a large mining community, the population of women was fairly low. Um, and with that, especially Chinese women. Um, during the Chinese Exclusion Act, the language of that um, series of laws limited immigration to only the wives of high-ranking diplomats with all of the correct paperwork from both governments. Um, so we see a large amount of alcohol and tobacco in here. While I jokingly refer to that as the bachelor section, we know it was widely used by all people of all relationship statuses. Okay, so I'm going to move us back out to our main room here again. I know lots of spinning around on this little 3D model. So there are a few things to note in this main room. Here we have an air hoop. This is also known as a two-string fiddle or a spike fiddle. We also have just above that second altar here in the corner is a liquor license issued to Lung On from 1895 to 1896. Not the only year he was licensed, but one of the remaining documents. And on this wall here, we see two banking calendars. During the Great Banking Collapse, Ing Hay, Lung On, and one of our largest local ranchers, Herman Oliver, fully backed our local bank, the Grant County Bank, so that all patrons could have access to funds. We know that Lung On also gave the first National Bank of Portland a very substantial loan during the same time period for the same purpose. While we don't know the exact amount of that loan, we do know it was never repaid. Um, they did send a lovely thank you letter, though. Some of you may recognize the building on the top of this calendar. This still sits in Portland today and is now Wells Fargo. Lung On and Ing Hay largely changed the local sentiment towards Chinese residents in John Day and Grant County at large. 
allowing them many more benefits that would be considered illegal throughout the United States. Under that Chinese Exclusion Act, Chinese residents were not permitted to have bank accounts. Not only did Inghe and Lungan have bank accounts, but they were wealthy enough to back multiple banks. That's not to say that they were free of discrimination or violence by any means, but that they just had slightly more benefits in this area for a portion of time. Another object that has something to do with one of those benefits is this green object right here on the top shelf. This is an external extra gas tank for a Model A. We have that because Lung An was one of the first people to own a vehicle in Grant County. Not only was that the case, but he also opened the first car dealership east of the Cascades and one of the first car dealerships Chinese owned in North America. This was called the Tourist Garage and was located on Main Street of John Day, right where 26 and 395 separate ways. At the Tourist Garage, Lung An had five white employees in addition to a number of service stations throughout the county. So not only did they own property and have bank accounts, but they even had white employees, all things that would be considered illegal under that Chinese Exclusion Act. It's simply incredible what Inghe and Lung An were able to accomplish under such a severe set of laws aimed directly at Chinese residents of the United States. As we look around this room, I'll point out a couple more things. There are lots of pieces of paper on the wall with Chinese characters on them. The majority of these are Chinese proverbs. While we don't have full translations for all of them, and I am not aware of all of the translations that we do have, I can tell you what some of them are for. This set of three right here to the right of this door is actually a list of donor donors that donated to that Suezian boat shrine. Um, most of these are Chinese proverbs. As you can see on this one, some of them actually have gold flake put into that paper. This one here is my favorite of those proverbs. It's another one that has gold flake in it. It roughly translates to something along the lines of, I have so many friends, they're like clouds in the sky, but the ones that are most important are here with me now. That gold flake in that paper is a reference to those clouds or to the heavens where some of the friends may reside. Okay, so I will take us into the kitchen and boarding room for the entirety of the use of this building. Let me get it to load here and I'll give us a quick look around this room. So this is still in that original 1865 portion of this building. Starting in 1888, you were able to rent space on one of these bunks for five cents a night. I specifically say space because you'd sleep up to four per bed. So this is occupancy for 16. Lung on would have been one of those 16 from 1888 until the addition on the north side in 1914. Thankfully, it said he was an extrovert. As this was his bedroom here in the corner, we can find his business desk. Just above that desk is a framed photo of banks from that first National Bank of Portland. That reads, Too Long On of John Day, Oregon, a staunch friend and loyal supporter of First National Bank. Just below that to the right, you'll see a black framed print of three horses. Our curator has cleaned just the corner of that print to give you a better idea of how much soot and grime is in this building. The ceilings are not painted black and the walls are not painted brown. There was three wood stoves in here, one in operation year round as the kitchen, food cooking, tea steeping, incense burning, extremely heavy tobacco use, up to 17 people staying here a night in addition to the social events in the next room. And as we know, personal hygiene was not a top priority in the Gold Rush West. A good example of what the original interior color would have looked like are these two bunks here. These boards are replaced during 1970 historic renovations. So that nice soft yellow everywhere instead of black and brown. On top of Lung An's desk, we'll also see a little bit of branded merchandise, both for Cam Wah Chung and the tourist garage. They made a lot of branded merchandise for their businesses, including a large series of calendars. Let me see if I can get us close to one of those here. So this is a calendar just here above the bunks. All of the calendars that they created have very white centric patriotic imagery. So white women, white families, screaming eagles, flowing flags, Norman Rockwell paintings, not necessarily things you might anticipate to represent two Chinese owned and operated businesses. As we look around the bunks, you'll see a number of ads for suits. 
Lung On was known to always wear a very American-styled three-piece suit along with a gentleman's hat and have a cigar in his mouth. But he also offered a service where you could come in and be measured for a suit. He would help you determine the cut color and textile and manage shipping and receiving for you. Even the underside of this bunk here is covered in those advertisements, running in multiple directions to accommodate people sleeping head to toe. We can also see someone's body oil stain on these advertisements from sleeping so tightly up against this wall on top of a mattress that they left behind their body oil. Here you can see their head, their shoulder, and the rest of their torso. If we take a look at the ceiling of this building, you can also pick out some original knob and tube wiring. This was one of the first structures in John Day with electricity, and we still use the same system today. Three of the light bulbs that were in the other room are operated off of that system, as well as the one here above the desk and one more that you will see. They had their first electric bill in 1902. On this end of the room, I'm gonna talk about some of our original 1865 features. So when this was built as a stagecoach stop for the white community. The first of those is this small window at the end. This is actually a rifle port. During times of conflict here at the stagecoach shop, you'd be able to open that glass interior shutter, the iron exterior shutter, stick your long rifle out and fire if necessary. While Chinese residents of this community could not utilize that for the same purpose, especially before the turn of the century, there are some theories that suggest they may have used it as a takeout window. We know that they were providing meals for their boarders as well as offering meals to the public. This is one of the largest and most stable kitchens within this community. And with the room next door being as busy as it was with all of those different purposes and only the one door, it makes sense that you'd find an alternative way to get food out to patrons. But there was a lot of chewing in those days. Are there spittoons? And if not, why aren't there tobacco splatters all over the floor? <laughs> there um, are, to my knowledge, there are not spittoons within this building. Um, while they did offer chewing tobacco for sale, the majority of the tobacco that's in the mercantile is smoking tobacco. Um, I'm not sure why we wouldn't see a lot of the, that wear on the floor, um, you know, from people using chewing tobacco and things like that. Um, but that's a really interesting thing to point out. They may have been using um, not not the typical spittoon that we would see within a lot of Western spaces. Um, they may have been using other containers or vessels, um, but that's a really good question. I'd have to look into that more and check the sales of how much um, chewing tobacco they sold versus smoking tobacco. Okay, so another one of those original 1865 features is indoor water, a widely unknown luxury to all communities at the time. This greatly benefited the Chinese residents that later occupied this building, especially during times of sundown law, when it was risking your life or safety to get fresh water at night. The last of those original 1865 features that I'll point out today is this small square in the floor right here. Um, this is actually a very tall post that's been buried deep in the ground to create a solid point in the floor. This solid point is specifically for chopping firewood. Um, you might be able to see the slight circular depression above that post in the floor from this round of wood right here being stacked on top of that post over and over again, allowing you to split your firewood inside. You can even see spots on the floor where the axe head has missed over time. I always wish I had that one in my house. It'd be pretty nice. <laughs> Just behind the stove is the last altar that we'll see today. Let me see if I can get us a little bit closer over here complete with an orange and pomegranate, again from 1948 at the youngest. And this is also our closest look at some of the really fine decor on these altars. The intricately painted figurines, the delicate paintwork on that very thin foil, and of course the beautiful feathers. Let me back us up here and get us to another spot. So as we look around the kitchen, we can see some more brands that we'll still recognize today. Let me get my screen to load. Here is Treetop Apple Cider, Hunt Cider Vinegar, a box of Wheaties on the left-hand counter. You can also see an empty Skippy peanut butter jar. There is also Del Monte. Those cans look almost exactly the same in the grocery store today, especially the green beans. Let me get us over here. Oh, pardon me, let me get this rearranged. 
Let's see if I can get rid of that. There we go. There is also 7-Up, Coca-Cola, Wesson Oil, and Lee and Parents, all brands that we can still see and recognize in our grocery stores today from those labels. What is White King a sugar or a flour? What is White King? White King is actually a laundry detergent. Ah. Um, yep. So this is, you can just make out the A and P oh, no. from it saying soap. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So I'm going to move us into our next room here. So we are now in the most modern portion of this building. This is the 1914 edition on the north side below that lowest peak. So this was added as Longon's private residence. The room that we're in now was his bedroom and the room behind this red door was his living room and office. This portion of the building received the most damage during the time it was unoccupied, as evident by the water staining on this wall. Because of that, both of the floor and the ceiling have been replaced in this portion of the building and the majority of the artifacts that were in here are too delicate to remain on display. So they are kept under strict climate control in our archive. Pardon me, but we do have some of Lungan's items in here today. As I mentioned, he was a very sharp dresser, typically wearing a three-piece suit along with a gentleman's hat and a cigar. Here you can find his summer fedora. He also kept very strict ledgers for all of his businesses. This was not only Cam Chung and the tourist garage, but investments in timber, investments in cattle, multiple racehorses, pasture land in Long Creek, land around John Day, home rentals throughout the county, and a warehouse in Portland. At the time of his passing, they were able to find six bank accounts in his name. Those totaled over $90,000. Today, that would be equal to about $2.3 million. So with substantial liquid wealth, as well as many other assets, it's interesting that he chose to remain in this humble building. I think that really speaks to how poorly Chinese residents were treated, especially before the turn of the century. It would be difficult to leave the security of a stone structure after facing that kind of discrimination and violence. Um, just behind this door here, which we don't have access to on our 3D model, is our operations room. It was once Lungon's living room and business office. Today, it contains our fire suppression system. So we have a series of nitrogen tanks along with a large water tank. Space throughout the building are small emitters. There's one just here on the wall that we can't quite make out. If a fire were to start in this building, those emitters would flood the building with nitrogen and increase the humidity using that big water tank. Starving the fire of oxygen with relatively little damage to any remaining artifacts. State Parks has really put their money where their mouth is and they've invested about $2 million into this system. Today, you've not only seen the home of the largest collection of Chinese immigrant documents from the Gold Rush West in North America, but you've also seen the largest collection of pre-communist traditional Chinese medicine items in the world. So two collections truly worth preserving and protecting. We also keep our electrical and security system in this room as well. And if you're here in person, there is also another fun surprise to see in there, a small carving on the wall that we believe was done between 1865 and 1914. Unfortunately, I don't have access of photos of that to show you today. So you'll just have to give us a visit. I do have a question from Don Kimball. Um, Just a quick question that he wants me to read. Do you know where his race horses ran? Where where were they? Tell us a little more about those yeah. horses. So um, there was actually a racetrack here in John Day. Um, today it is now our fairgrounds. Um, you can see that in a lot of old photos of John Day taken from hilltops. Um, Lung An had multiple racehorses, and he typically named them after the people that he purchased them from. Um, so there was one that was named Nellie after Nellie Black. I believe there was one that was named Dr. Watson. Um, quite a few interesting names and different horses, which we do have some photos of those, but not many. Oh, wow. Uh, we do have a question from Friendly House. Go ahead with your question. Yes. Is the is the upstairs of the building uh, open to the public or is that uh, also operational? Um, the upstairs of the building is not open to the public. Um, it does not have the same structural integrity as the rest of the building. We do keep photos of that on hand in our interpretive center um, that we can show to you if you're here. Um, I will tell you that they mostly utilize that portion of the building as storage. Um, it was never utilized for its intended purpose of boarding. 
It contained part of our over 20,000 document collection when it was reopened in 1968. And today that portion of the building just sits empty. Uh, it's pretty anticlimactic from what you may imagine what it, it would look like up there. Um, it is just a single layer of that shiplap wood. So it's very poorly insulated, <laughs> very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. And the walls are just covered in a plain brown paper. Um, I believe there's one small section where they utilize newspaper to help cover the walls, but um, nothing too exciting. <laughs> and, and a second question I had is what happened to the large Chinese population that used to uh, go there? They, they just find another place to go for holidays? and. So um, let's see, by around, starting around the turn of the century, around 1900, but by 1910, um, the Chinese population had largely left this area. Um, there were, were only 50 Chinese residents on census record by 1910 in John Day. A lot of those Chinese residents moved on to other areas where they could find different kinds of labor in a way to provide for themselves. Um, by 1910, we were pretty much at the point of dredge mining here, um, which as we know today is a very large piece of equipment that really tears through the landscape and does a fair amount of damage. Um, that was typically a white man's game and required much less manual labor. Um, so those Chinese residents moved on to other gold rushes throughout the West, fishing in canneries on the coast, or returned to China if they could afford to do so. Thank you. Joyce on the Zoom audience has a question. Yeah. Can you come in, Joyce? I tried to type my question in, but I'm such a poor typist that I'm going to have to ask it. <laughs> um, what of the different factors do you think helped him uh, to stay under the radar of the Exclusion Act? Of course, he had wealth, but that was later on. He was humble. He was quiet. He stayed in his place. Um, but what helped him with that? And then what ex actually examples of harassment or discrimination against um, I forgot his name now. Uh, Ing Wei. Ing Hei. Ing Hei. Do we have? So um, Ing Hei and Lung An are pretty unique in the respect that they both likely arrived to the U.S. with funds. Um, that's pretty unique for a Chinese immigrant story during that time period. Um, a lot of Chinese uh, people that came to the United States during that time period came on scholarship or excuse me, sponsorships, um, which they spent the rest of their life working off for an incredibly low wage. It was not uncommon to be kidnapped at a port and brought to the US by force. So slavery, um, or if you could afford your own transport to arrive here to the US, um, it was still extremely low wages. So Long An and Ing Pei both were unique in the respect that they arrived with funds they came from uh, what we would consider upper class families. So they were both educated um, and that really gave them uh, an incredible step essentially, um, allowing them to be able to have access to many other things that the majority of Chinese residents did not. Um, Lung An was also widely utilized by law enforcement, preachers, judges, community members, as a translator, um, being both fluent in English and Chinese. Um, there are lots of oral histories and written histories that speak to um, those preachers and lawyers and judges all coming to the Kamwa Chung building at night to play poker with Lung An. Um, so he was well-respected by well-respected members of the white community. And that really allowed him such a benefit um, that was extremely unusual for that time period. Um, there's also the argument that Kamwa Chung is one of the most successful businesses in Eastern Oregon from, from the gold rush. There are freight records in the Dalles that have over a million pounds of product a year coming up the Columbia to the Dalles with the final destination of Kamwa Chung. Um, it said that they kept over a million dollars in product on hand at all times. Um, so it would be difficult to have a solid argument for shutting down one of the most successful and economic drivers of John Day and Eastern Oregon at that time period. Um, they have a very unique story. Um, you know, a, the majority of Chinese residents of the U.S. at that time were not afforded that same level of safety or respect, even though that was still a low level. Um, some examples of harassment that especially Doc Hay experienced. 
um, after Lungon passed, Doc K was legally blind. Um, and there is a story of a group of young men breaking into that building during the summer when Doc K was still living in that building. Um, they cut a hole through the screen door and crawled on the floor into the building in search of firecrackers or liquor or cash. Um, and the story goes that Doc Hay woke up while they were there and threw that cleaver through his bedroom door and landed in the wall of the apothecary, <laughs> um, narrowly missing the young men. But those young men got out and did not come back. Um, <laughs> there are also many other uh, written histories or oral histories um, within Grant County in our collections here that are not as lighthearted as that one may seem. Um, you know, many other stories of um, Chinese laborers that were within the area that were taunted and harassed and experienced violence at the hands of children for fun. Um, and those Chinese residents could do nothing to protect or defend themselves as they were white children. So it was endure the violence. And you showed us a slew of medicine bottles and I understand they have been very effective. I'm curious to know, are they being recreated and used for treatment now? Yes, so um, you can still purchase Po Chai pills today. Um, we even have that same formula, that same brand that Doc Hay carried. Um, our friends group actually sells in our um, interpretive center today. Um, there is a lot of Chinese medicine that is still utilized that Doc Hay was using. Um, we also have a partnership with OCOM or the Oregon College of Orient Oriental Medicine to have Doc Hay's formulas translated. Um, he wrote down over 1,500 formulas. Um, we've had that partnership with OCOM for about five years. Um, and again, that's it's a great example of how difficult it can be to translate these historic dialects. Um, they have less than 10% of those formulas translated after five years. Um, so Doc Hay's formulas are still being studied. The, especially the mass-produced and pre-packaged um, traditional Chinese medicine that Doc Hay offered, you can still find for sale today. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> my fantasy is that there were real political machinations to get this property out of the hands of the uh, people, the government of John Day and into the hands of the state. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how that happened? And we get a pool that gets <laughs> paved over and <laughs> can you tell um, that story. So, uh, when the state acquired this property that was uh, much before my time um, here at the park, um, that was in 2006. Um, I know that the city did not, um, was not willing to sell this property to the state without the previous curator um, being in agreement, um, Carolyn Meisenheimer. Um, there is a book out that she wrote today um, called Anecdotes and Antidotes. Um, and while that's a lovely book, um, you know, you continue learning as time progresses. And so today we know that there are some inaccuracies in that book um, that we wouldn't recommend, but she had to be in agreement in order for the city to allow the state to take over this property. Um, and I know that was a big portion of that. Um, and this state, this now state facility was procured through uh, Oregon State Lottery funding. Um, so if you buy lottery tickets, you're helping fund your Oregon State Parks. <laughs> um, the pool situation is more recent and a little bit different. Um, our pool had not been utilized um, in a number of years. Um, I believe about four years, possibly longer by the time that it was demolished. Um, that pool had, um, I mean, while I swam in it as a child, I can tell you that in recent years, especially during swim meets that occurred, um, children were being electrocuted in the pool during swim meets. Um, so that pool was really not a usable public resource. Um, the city of John Day sold that to state parks. And with that, the pool had to be demolished um, because it was not an effective use of space and was not a safe structure to utilize. Um, now that state parks now has that property, um, we intend to build a new interpretive center there. Um, that is funded through an Oregon Go bond. 
it will be about 9,000 square feet. It will include our interpretive center, uh, lab space, uh, let's see, more archive space. It will have community rooms. It will have a theater. It will have a partial full-scale replica of the interior of the historic building, allowing it to be ADA accessible and making it much easier for when we have school groups in. Um, and will just allow us to even be open longer throughout the year. Um, currently, we're only open from May 1st to October 31st. We're kind of a fair weather museum. Um, since we do let you into the historic building, we really have to be mindful of, uh, you know, different weather that may, have, may occur. We don't want to be taking a lot of moisture and humidity into that building with us or having the temperature change severely when we open and close those doors in the off season. Yes, um, I would have fantasized that electrification would have come to John Day through the rural electrification program uh, under uh, Roosevelt, but you suggested it came much earlier. Do you yeah. have any information about how electrification came to that part of Oregon? Yeah, so the city of John Day um, did have electricity much earlier than you would anticipate. The city actually held a contest to see who could create an effective power generator. Um, in the, I believe that it in the final stages of that, it came down to a water power generator versus a coal generator. Um, the coal generator won, and that was only an operation for, I believe, less than 15 years before it was in a, a state of disrepair that it could no longer be utilized. So the city of John Day actually had power for a very short period of time and then went back to no power until that rural electrification under Roosevelt. Just a quick comment on uh, the building having indoor water. Mm -hmm. When we used to visit my aunt in the 1940s, she did not have indoor water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real luxury that we can take for granted today. <laughs> Ranger Coleman, what... I find fascinating by this, I mean, the whole thing I find fascinating, but that there was a public park mm -hmm. and this building, I mean, was there and the citizens for 30 years didn't destroy it. I mean, just in curiosity, the kids, yes. you know, that they were, that nobody destroyed it. I mean, what's that story? So while it wasn't destroyed, um, people definitely broke into that building. <laughs> um, you know, mostly teenagers. We still have those once teenagers in our community today. And they'll tell you how scary it was to break into that building. Um, there was a lot of local lore about that area of town. Um, a lot of ghost stories. Um, there, all of those Chinese proverbs would also look pretty ominous if you were in there and you didn't know they were about friendship and goodwill and good morals. You start to find things like those bear paws, those dried geckos, and you get out pretty quick. Um, okay. But we are seeing a lot of those items that were taken returned um, over the years as people age or as families start to recognize those items. Um, this year alone, we've had over a half dozen items returned, That's or excuse me, over a dozen items returned. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, could you tell yes, folks? I had a question. Oh, oh, here's a question coming. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, hi there. Thanks, Michaela. Very interesting. Thank um, you. I had a question about present day John Day. Mm -hmm. How is the community relate to the to the whole uh, site? And uh, is there interest? Is there pride? Is I mean, just how is how how are they doing? How do they feel about the facility? And also, uh, how many visitors do you have? Chinese people coming to visit? What's 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 the numbers on some of that? So um, our community is kind of split. Um, there are, you know, people who absolutely love and recognize what this is here, but there are also people that have lived in this community their entire lives and have never been inside. Uh, for a lot of folks, it's just that weird building that was in the park by the pool. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was for me as a kid. I was like, why is there this weird building that we can't go in? <laughs> um, so it takes some time and more recognition to, to be able to see that. Um, but I think that that is really starting to come into play in a big way here in our local community, especially with the um, upcoming construction of our new interpretive center. It's getting a lot more recognition for the gem and the prize and the collection that it is, um, not only for John Day, but for the world. 
Um, we do get a lot of visitors. Um, this is our first year that we've been back towards pre-pandemic numbers. Um, we're on track with what we had in 2019 right now. And in that six month season in 2019, we had 10,000 visitors. Um, this year, we've definitely seen a big increase in um, visitors of Chinese descent. Um, there was recently just a new documentary that came out about Kam Wah Chung, um, which you can find on YouTube. It's a Chinese documentary. Um, it does have an English voiceover if you're interested, but that actually won the New York Film Festival um, in the first year of COVID and it has now been published throughout China. So just gaining a lot more traction for what we have here. Rachel Coleman, can you just real briefly tell folks how they could come and tour this site in person? Because you have to have a reservation, is my understanding. Uh, while we don't require reservations, we do recommend them. Um, we offer seven tours a day, and those tours are limited to eight people. Um, so it's a good idea to make a reservation if you know that you'll be here. Um, the tour is really wonderful. It lets you into that historic building, um, just as we saw on that VR 3D tour. Um, but there, you also have access to that VR tour if you're interested. Um, you may have noticed quite a few dots on the VR tour throughout our screen. Those are all data points. Um, you can find that VR tour at our friends website, um, the friends of Um Our friends group is a really important part of the museum here. They help to continue preservation, education, and events surrounding Cam Wah Chun. Um, I believe I even saw our president sign in uh, <laughs> on our Zoom today. So hi, Katie, thanks for joining us. Um, but that is a really big part of what happens here. Um, so you're welcome to come over for a tour. We are open seven days a week from May 1st to October 31st. And we offer seven tours a day with a maximum of eight people. Um, we also accept special tours. So if a group of you would like to come over, we're more than happy to make special accommodations um, with some notice and make a special tour for you. Thank you. We have a question from Friendly House. Come on in, Hank. Um, I think what you showed us were all things in the stone building Correct. rather than what's on top. Mm -hmm. What's on top? So that upper building is not a part of the VR tour. Um, that upper story was added around 1895 with the hope that they would need additional space for borders um, with the idea that the railway was coming to John Day. But as we know today, it never made it quite this far. Um, they mostly utilized that portion of the building as storage. When it was reopened in 1968, it contained a portion of our 20,000 document collection. Um, today, that upper story just sits empty. We do have photos of the interior of that portion of the building here at the Interpretive Center, um, which you're welcome to see if you come in person. Um, but we currently do not allow public access to that upper story. It's just not, uh, doesn't have the structural integrity for us to be able to take guests up there. Uh, Ranger Coleman, oh, the, the doctor was um, treating. And yes. he was a recognized physician in the area, yet I doubt he had a license. How did, I mean, as time went on, from what I understand, he was treating in the 40s, in my early 40s. Yes, so I mean, Doc he was, was required. Uh, Doc Hay was treating up until he broke his hip in 1948. Okay. Uh, we saw people in our community today that were treated or saved by Doc Hay as children, um, which is pretty incredible to consider. But yes, Doc Hay did not have a medical license. There was actually three separate occasions um, where he was sued by local doctors for practicing without a license. And each time those lawsuits were completely thrown out of court. <laughs> um, so he was acquitted of all of those charges each time. Um, it was said within our community that you went to Doc Hay for everything except a broken bone. If you had a broken bone, you went to Dr. Martha. <laughs> But he, he was, it was acquitted, even though he really was guilty. I mean, he was practicing without a license. Absolutely yeah. correct. Okay. Well, that's the legal system there. <laughs> um, you know, I know if someone came to the museum, there's so many other wonderful things to see in your area, even though it's about a five-hour drive from Portland. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what, what else is out there that you'd encourage people to come visit? Yeah, so a very common route for folks, especially traveling from the west side, um, is to see the Painted Hills, the Thomas Condon Visitor Center, which is a local paleontology center here. There's also the Camp Ranch, which is just across the road from that Thomas Condon Visitor Center. Um, and that is a historic sheep farm um, in our area where they actually produced a lot of the wool used by the US military um, over the last century. We also have some more local museums. There is also the Grant County Ranch and Rodeo Museum. There is the Grant County History Museum, which has uh, Joaquin Miller's cabin, um, which uh, as we know, I believe was the first poet laureate of Oregon. Um, there is also the DeWitt Museum located in Prairie City, which is the, that last depot, the closest that the railway ever got to John Day. Um, and of course we have a lot of the outdoors to explore in this area. You know, when I was out there in May, it, we hiked every day. We saw your museum. It was such a rich, rich trip and to, to explore Oregon that yeah. way. I, I loved it. I just loved it. And the drive there was actually quite beautiful, even though yeah. it was quite, you got to make sure your tank of gas is full. I mean, <laughs> you aren't going to go out there without uh, water in your car and uh, a full tank of gas. Yeah, it's a bit of a trek, but it's a really beautiful area of Oregon that um, is largely unrecognized for its rich history and what it has to offer. Right.